The diode rings are a wonderful, very useful tool. They come in pairs, although they can be used singly. The pair always consists of a green, which was formerly blue, diode ring, and a red diode ring. The green is supposed to be more dispersing, and the red ring is more tonifying. There are germanium diodes with a specific gate that interacts with the body's electromagnetic field. They can be used on the fingers to activate the meridians, close to the wells that springs up the meridian flow, the Jing well points. They can also be used to stimulate specific points. Or they can be taped locally on the body, and then that effect can be emphasized with the use of the three bypass cord, aluminum foil, a patchy patchy to increase the blood flow to the area and reduce inflammation and pain. The direction of the diode is thought of as circulating towards the edge with a color. The direction of the diode, how it is placed on the body, is important. When a pair of diodes are taped on the body, the diodes are placed color facing color, meaning red towards green. Because over time the diode color will fade, the ring is clearly marked with the color and side or direction of the diode. If you're using two rings, place them touching each other, red towards green. I follow the same rule even when the rings are not touching. For example, if I use the rings for TMJ, one on each side, although the rings are not touching, each one is on the opposite side stomach 6 area, I still place them facing towards each other, that is the color is going towards the nose. It just makes for a good habit. If the area is large and you're using multiple rings, start with a major area with the rings facing color to color, the green on the most painful area, and then the red one right next to it. Then extend it on one side with a third ring that will be an opposite color to the ring it is touching. So here I added another red ring next to the green one, and these are facing white to white, non-color to non-color. Then a fourth ring can extend it even more and it will touch the third ring color to color and it will be opposite color to that third ring. So here I added a green diode ring and it's hard to see because it's totally faded but that fourth ring on the right is a green one and it is facing that third diode ring. You can of course play with this and make not just lines, but cover other kinds of areas using the same principle. For larger areas, diode chains are often recommended, although I tend to use to prefer the use of rings as long as I can cover the area with four rings or less. For joints that can be surrounded, diode chains are definitely preferred. Especially on the fingers or the toes, the direction of the diodes really does matter. The ring should be placed on the fingers so it is pointing or flowing towards large intestine 4. That means that the thumb is always getting a diode ring in a direction that is opposite that of the other fingers. Similarly, on the foot, place the rings so that they face towards liver 3. When I place the ring on the fingers, I do so with the diode on the yang side, the non-palmer side. This way I can see that the color side of the diode is facing large intestine 4. Once the ring is placed, it can rotate and the diode, that pearl thing, can be touching any other part of the finger. The rings also do not have to stay at the base of the finger, but when they slide down towards the tip, Patients tend to feel that they need to hold them and they might tense. So I often tape the rings in order to avoid that. Do not use more than four rings on the fingers or toes at any given time. That means no more than two fingers on one side. When using two rings on one hand, those rings should be of different colors. When using the same finger, on both hands, on two sides, 
each hand, each finger, should carry the opposite color. I use rings on the fingers a fair amount. You can think of those as a systemic or root treatment in a ring. I do not use the toes as much, partially because it is less convenient to mount the rings on the toes, and partially because it seems the rings are much more powerful on the fingers. Kawai seems to think this is because the charge on the hands is greater. For example, we do not practice Qigong holding energy balls with our feet. The thumb is used for lung issues and insomnia, and on the right side it is used for liver types. Use a red ring on the right thumb for deficiency. Use a green ring on the right thumb for excess liver types. The index finger is used for skin problems, for any face issues like sinus problems, or for digestion issues. The middle finger is used for autonomic nervous system types, including blood pressure problems and reflex sympathetic dystrophy, also known as Sudeck syndrome or regional pain syndrome. The middle finger is also used for chest or heart pain, as well as for shoulder pain, usually combined with the middle finger. The ring finger is used for what the Japanese like to call neuralgic neuritis. This includes things like anxiety, panic attacks, nervousness, getting palpitation easily, things like that. It is also used for insomnia, tremors, numbness, and tingling. It is related to the autonomic nervous system, as is the middle finger. The ring finger is also used for autoimmune disorders. The little finger is used for neck pain, back pain, for shoulder pain, with a middle finger as well, for cardiac conditions, in which case it always gets the red ring on the left little finger, and for gynecological issues. On the toes, the big toe is used for liver issues and for gout. The second toe is used for throat and for heel pain. The third toe is used for chest and heart pain. The fourth toe is used for knees, low back pain, sacroiliac pain, and for sciatica. The fifth toe is used for shoulder pain, heel pain, together with the second toe, for ankle pain, and for gynecological issues. What color you use on which finger does not matter so much except in two cases. For cardiac patients, the left little finger must always carry the red ring, since we do not reduce the heart. For liver patients, in cases of liver excess, we use the right thumb with a green diode ring, and in cases of liver deficiency, we use a red diode ring on the right thumb. If either the, re the left little finger or the right thumb are going to be used, start with this guideline and then work out the color of the other rings you want to use accordingly. Say a patient has a cardiac condition with liver deficiency and autonomic nervous system symptoms, let's say low blood pressure or high blood pressure, either one. I start with the red on the left little finger for the cardiac, then for the liver deficiency, red on the right thumb for liver deficiency. That means that any other ring I will be using is going to be green. Say I, use, I choose pericardium finger on the left side. It will have to be a green ring. I no longer have the option of using the right, um, the right pericardium finger on the right side because that ring is already dictated as green by the red ring on the right thumb due to the liver deficiency. So, I can only use one of the pericardium fingers because if I use them both, they're both going to be green. If I want to use um, something on the right hand, it's going to now have to be the ring finger, which is also autonomic nervous system, and then I'm able to conform the rules. Now, on the right side, I have red on the thumb and green on the pericardium finger, and on the left side, I have red on the heart finger 
and the middle finger has a green. Okay, let's look at that for a second because it will be easier to see. So here there's a red ring for the heart on the little finger on the left side. There's a red ring on the thumb for the liver deficiency. Now for autonomic nervous system, I'm starting with a green diode ring on the middle finger. The middle finger, now I only have a green ring left, so I cannot use the middle finger. I have to choose another finger or not use another finger on the right side. If the patient has cardiac and liver excess, the rings will be different. Again, because of the cardiac issue, we start with a red ring on the left little finger. The right thumb now gets a green ring because it is liver excess. Now we have a different color ring on each hand. That means that I can use both pericardial fingers because on the left side it can be green to contrast the red ring on the left middle finger. And on the right side it will be red, which is properly contrasting the green ring on the right thumb. Let's look at that in practice. So, left little finger gets a red. The green goes on the right thumb because it's liver excess. Now for the autonomic nervous system, I can use both pericardial fingers. Green on the left pericardial finger and red on the right pericardial finger. And now each hand has two different rings of two different colors, four in all. It's actually not that complicated once you get used to it. And again, the only time the colors really matter is when you have heart conditions or liver issues. So ring direction always towards large intestine four or liver three in the case of feet. No more than four rings at a time, two on each hand. Same finger should always get opposite color if it's on the same finger, opposite side. On the same hand, you, if you're using two um, rings, use one red, one green, and always start with the cardiac and liver and dictate the rest that way. Let's look at how that gets manipulated. Okay, so when we put a ring on, you put the ring facing large intestine four. Then, Kawhi like to shake the needles. Okay. Kiko, on the other hand, likes to just move them up and down. I tend to follow Kiko in this, um, in this manner as well. So I tend to move the rings up and down, um, partially because they, if they already have needles in their hands and I'm shaking their hand, um, it makes their arm needles activate. So it's easier to move the finger up and down. And then after you've moved it, you can actually tape the ring to the base of the finger so that it doesn't move and the patient doesn't have to tighten on it. When using diode rings or chains on the body, I tend to not connect them to remote points with a three bypass cord, but to connect the red and green clip to the rings or the chain, cover the area with aluminum foil, spark the foil, and connect the black clip to the foil. My preference when taping diode rings on the body is to use the magnetic, the gold-plated rings, while my preference on the fingers are the copper rings. The aluminum foil treatments can also be done with a remote point that releases the area, needling and sparking that point and placing the black clip on that needle. However, the sensation of a spark can be quite strong when it's done on the needle, and I find that sparking the foil only is not just more pleasant, it is usually just as effective or possibly more. There are other ways to use remote points with diode rings and aluminum foil. One of them is to use a regular iron pumping cord with a black clip connected to the rings or foil and the red clip connected to the remote point. Another way is to use the Hibiki 7 with a black clip of the Hibiki 7 connected to the rings or the chain and the red probe zapping the ear point that corresponds to the area affected. It is actually more effective to use the back of the ear rather than the front. Since the skeletal system is represented on the ear scapha and antihelix, 
The backside of these points is easily available, unlike the organ ear points, which are in the conchas. Let's look at the rings as they're done with a foil in practice. So here we have two rings. The red ring is closer to the tailbone, and that got the green clip. The red clip is on the green diode ring. Put the aluminum foil on. I'm using his pants to tighten it at the bottom, and then I'm taping the foil onto the back so it's touching the skin as much as possible, not just floating. The foil needs to touch. Black clip goes on the back of the patchy. Spark the foil. Touch the foil when you're sparking. Take the black cliff off and put it on the foil. You can ionize the air above it if you like. Do that every 10 minutes, three times. Then the needles can come out. This treatment we just saw, placing diode rings on the vertebrae, putting the three bypass cord gray, red and green clips on it, covering with aluminum foil and sparking is my favorite treatment for disc problems, slip disc and things of that nature. Diod rings and chains treatments are excellent for bone, vertebrae, joint and ligament issues as well as vascular problems, but it is not my first choice for muscular issues. Treating any scar that still has pain on it, that is it's keloidic, or still is discolored can be extremely important in treatments because the scar represents a stagnation of qi and blood and interrupts the flow of the meridian. If a scar has pain when pressing on it, it should be treated. A scar that has no pain on it and looks fully healed should still be checked to see if pressing on the scar serves to release pain in other reflexes on the body. If it does, that scar should be either needled or treated with the diode rings. To treat with diode rings, tape the green diode ring on the most painful spot and tape the red diode ring on a less painful spot so that the rings are touching and facing color to color. They can also be extended with a third or even a fourth ring. If there's no pain on the scar, but that scar releases other reflexes, that means that scar is important and needs to be treated. Place the rings on the scar color to color. Doesn't matter exactly where, but where you pressed and it releases the reflex, that's where the rings should go. Remember that the scar that shows on the skin is only the area that was cut and sutured on the skin. There's also scarring under the skin, extending away from the area where the surgical instruments were probing in. Place the green clip of the three bypass cord on the red diode ring. Place the red clip on the green ring. Cover the area with foil and tape the foil to the skin. The black clip of the three bypass cord goes on the back of the patchy and the foil is sparked. Patients might feel either nothing or a very mild tingling. On a rare occasion, a patient will feel a little electrical feeling under the ring. Remove the black clip from the back of the patchy and place it on the foil. You can now spark the air above the foil to ionize it. Come back after 10 minutes and spark again, and then spark at the end of the treatment. Let's look at a treatment of scar. There's a scar which is very hard to see. It actually looks very good in terms of visual. But when you press on this scar, it's just below the navel on the Ren line. It was from tubal ligation. She said she woke up three times during the operation. In other words, she was totally aware of what's going on. So she had a sort of shock. When you press on the scar, it released for her Ren 17, which is anxiety reflex. So there's a connection between her symptoms and the scar, which is why I chose to treat it as a demonstration here, um, because the scar itself is so hard to see, um, normally wouldn't call for you to treat it. So let's look at that. Placing the green clip on the place that released REN17, sorry, the green diode ring, placing the red diode ring right next to it below, color to color, 
and taping the rings so they don't shift around. Now place the red clip on the green diode ring and the green clip on the red diode ring. Now placing foil over that, secure the foil so that it is touching the skin as much as possible. You can do that with a clothes, you can do that with tape. Usually you will need to put some tape on it. Then when the foil is secured, bring put the black clip on the back of the patchy, spark the foil, touch as you're sparking the foil, touch the foil, take the black clip from the back of the patchy and clip it on the foil. And then you can spark the air about around it. Okay. You can repeat this every 10 minutes for say three times. So at the end of the treatment, when you're taking out all the other needles, spark once again, pull out the needles, take the cords away and take the diet rings away. For neuropathy, I usually use a diode chain, unless it is a very small pinpointed area, in which case I will use a diode ring. Wrap the chain around the limb where it is numb. This is the better treatment for non-diabetic neuropathies, be it neurovascular compression, vertebral damage, drug-induced, etc. I use this treatment as part of the back treatment, usually, so that on the front I address the root of the problem and any other constitutional issues, and I may need needles in the area that is still numb, while on the back, where I'm less likely to be using points on the limbs, I can wrap the limb with foil and have it unavailable for needling. If the chain is long enough, try and wrap it around the knuckles of the fingers of the toes as those are the beginnings of the meridians. However, if that is not possible, you can place rings on the toes also. Place the red and green clips of the bypass cord on the chain with some distance between those two clips. In other words, don't place them right next to each other. Wrap the whole limb all the way up to where the numbness stops with a foil. On some people's legs, this may require two strips of foil. Make sure the black clip is outside the foil and that you still have some cord space outside of it in order to do the sparking. Pat the foil down so it is touching the skin tightly and completely. You do not want air pockets between the foil and the skin. Spark the foil throughout and place the black clip on the foil. Repeat the sparking after 10 minutes, and then just before you take all the needles out, spark again, then take the foil out and the chain off. So here we have the chain wrapped around the toes and then up to a little bit above the ankle, which is where presumably the numbness ends. The red clip and the green clip of the three bypass cord go on the chain, not too close together. Wrap the aluminum foil so it wraps around the whole foot and tape it so it doesn't open up. The black clip of the three bypass cord is still outside the aluminum foil so they can connect to the back of the patchy. And then spark all over the aluminum foil with the patchy. I'm not sparking as much as I should. It should go under the foot, etc., because this is a quick demonstration, so I didn't do as good a job on that. In terms of the placement of the red and green clip of the three bypass cord, in case you're using extension clips on a chain, the red clip of the three bypass cord should go closer to the black clip of the extension, while the green clip of the three bypass cord should go closer to the red clip of the extension chain. That is not all that important. In some cases, rubbing the red diode ring on the numb area is also very helpful. And I usually do that at the end of the treatment. So 
The treatment for neuropathy usually consists of I do a front treatment addressing whatever the root issues are, including root issues for the neuropathy, as well as root issues for the patient. Then I do the treatment we just saw, but I do it on the back as I do the back treatment. I continue to address root treatments, root causes. Then after this aluminum foil comes off this treatment, I can take a red diode ring and rub it vigorously, kind of like gua sha, on the numb area. And that can be very effective. For amputation pain or phantom pain, place a green ring on the stomp where the pain is. If it is phantom pain and the amputation is not a finger or a toe, place the ring on the site of the meridian where the meridian would be on the stomp. You can use more than one ring. Connect the red and green clips of the three bypass cord to the ring. Cover the whole stomp with aluminum foil. Spark the foil and place the black clip on the foil. This is one case where I do also spark a remote point that releases the area. For example, you might look at the Monica Mu points to release the pain on a particular meridian. Or you might look at the low point of the meridian that is opposite on the Chinese clock, etc. Similar to the neuropathy treatment, for a sprained ankle, wrist, or any joint, surround the joint with a chain and tape it onto the skin on a few places so it doesn't move. Be sure the chain is creating a closed loop. That is, the chain clasp is closed, or if you are using extension cords, that they are both biting, so to speak, that clipped onto the chain, the chain clips onto itself. Place the red and green clip of the bypass cord on the chain. I tend to place the green clip on the most painful spot and the red clip as far away from it as I can. Surround with foil and wrap around the joint. Ensure the foil is tight. Spark and place the black clip on the foil. So here we're looking at the treatment of a sprained wrist. I put the green clip on the most painful spot, the red clip on the opposite side as far away as I can from the most painful spot. Wrap the whole thing with aluminum foil. Make sure the black clip of the pachi is outside so you can still spark. Take the black clip, put it on the back of the pachi, spark the foil, and you can actually lift the arm and spark the palmer side as well. Take the black clip and place it on the aluminum foil. And that's it for sprained ankle. For lymphedema, the treatment requires a very long chain. You cross the fingers of the affected side and then zigzag the chain up the arm, going through the armpit, wrapping around three times. Bring the chain over to the other side around the neck and clip the chain back on itself so that the arm, the armpit, and the neck are all being encircled by the chain. Place the red clip of the three bypass cord on the chain by the fingers and the green clip at the armpit. With a black clip on the back of the pachi, spark the chain all over and place the black clip on the neck on the opposite side stomach 11 or magic thyroid point. The magic thyroid point is basically on the side where the neck and the shoulders meet. Just slide from gallbladder 21 towards the throat and that's pretty much the magic thyroid point. Looking at what that looks like and remember there is no fall, you're sparking the chain directly. So the fingers have already been wrapped around, the chain goes around, it circles, the, now we're circling the armpit, and it, even this very, very, very long chain is a little hard to get around on her neck. Okay, and this is a super long chain. Now, take the red clip of the three bypass cord on the fingers, the green one at the armpit, and I'm putting it outside the armpit so it can be seen where it is. 
take the black clip, put it on the back of the pachi, and start sparking all over the chain to get the lymph draining and moving. You should go a lot slower than I'm doing here. Okay. And sometimes they might feel a little spark and then place it on opposite sides, stomach 11 area. The magic thyroid point is actually slightly behind it. Okay. And you'd like to repeat that sparking a few times over, say, a 30 minute period. We already spoke of the treatment of eyes using the diet chain. Because it is a very, very useful treatment, it is worth repeating. So basically, fill each ear with part of the chain and tape it so it does not fall out. The middle of the chain passes on the back of the head above gallbladder 20, an area related to sight. Connect the green clip to the chain on the side of the worst eye and the red clip to the other side. Needle do 20 and spark it and place the black clip on it. This produces a very intense sensation, just like an earthquake inside the brain, but it is a highly effective treatment. When the eyesight is affected, you can actually test it before and after the treatment, asking the patient to say, read a page at a certain distance that is blurry for them, and then see if it's clearer after the treatment. Okay. So, green clip goes in on the chain, inside the ear, red clip goes on the chain inside the ear on the opposite side and the red clip goes on the side of the better eye black clip goes on the back of the pachi we spark do 20 and place the black clip on to do 20. The following treatments are what you might call quick and dirty ways of getting at things. Um, they, they're basically taping or placing a diet ring on the body. I usually do them in conjunction with other treatments, and then I just add these to sort of push things a little bit further along. Uh, they are definitely not the mainstay of the treatment, but they can be very useful. For example, when a patient is in a waiting room and you want to do something um, before you can take them in and you know, they can sit with a diet ring on them. Or if, uh, say, you're on the bus or a train and someone has a problem, you can put the rings on them, etc. Um, basically, I call them quick and dirty, but they're in the sense that they're very quick for you to do, but it's better that the diet ring stays on for at least 30 minutes. So this is not like one of those seven-second treatments. Um, but they're still useful um, as add-ons. For example, uh, any kind of problems, you can choose to use a magnetic, a gold diet ring, and squeeze it onto the ear point that's related, that represents that area in the body. Squeeze the ring so it's touching and pressuring on that ear point. So that's kind of like instead of using a needle or an ear seat or something, you can use a diet ring. For cough, lightly press on the area around REN22 until you find the spot where the pressure creates a tickling or a coughing sensation for the patient and tape a green diode ring on that point. This is with a green diode ring, not a red diode ring. For TMJ, you can use one ring on each side or two rings on one side or two rings on both sides. Find the most painful, tightest spot and tape the green ring on it and then add a red ring next to it if it is a larger area. Or if you're just using two rings, the worst side will get the green ring, the other side will get the red ring. I use this a lot in my clinic because lots of people have TMJ, and after you resolve what you can with TMJ, say with Sanja 8, with adrenal treatment, or, you know, behind gallbladder 21, etc., after you've done all that, adding diet rings is extremely helpful. And here we see two diet rings, color facing color, on one side. For swollen glands, for mumps, tape a green diode ring between stomach 6 and stomach 7, then tape the red ring on Sanjiao 17, 
make sure the rings are touching. This is a long treatment. In one hour, the pain and swelling are dramatically reduced. Mumps also relates to kidneys. For us, the kidneys are related to the salivary glands as well as spleen. So kidney three is a very useful point for mumps. For sore throat and tonsillitis, tape a diode ring on stomach nine, one on each side. For ear infections, tape the red ring on gallbladder two, Sanjar 21 area, and a green ring on the mastoid bone. Again, the, ring, the rings need to stay there for a while. For rheumatoid arthritis, tape a green ring on pericardium 8 and a red ring on Yao Tong Shui. Also use a diode ring on the ring finger, which is used for autoimmune disorders, and then a green ring on the most painful finger. So we can actually look at that. Pericardium 8 gets a green ring taped on. Red ring is on Yao Tong Shui, or Sanja 3. Then take a red ring and place it on the ring finger, which is related to rheumatoid problems, autoimmune disorders. Now let's say that it's his index finger was swollen, and that's the one that I placed the green um, diode ring on, and now he just moves around, and the pericardiumate fell, but I taped it back on. The Hibiki 7 is another excellent instrument. It is a point stimulator, as well as a point finder. My understanding is that originally Jingge Naomoto created it for testing the Jing well points, as well as for finding and stimulating ear points. I use it mostly for ear points. Kawai uses the Hibiki 7 to test the reactivity of Jing well points, much like Akabane testing, and to confirm the success of treatment by looking for better balance on the Jing well points after treatment. I use the Hibiki 7 only for treatment, not for assessment. The Hibiki 7, like other point stimulators, has two outlets. The negative outlet on the left connects with a white cord with a black clip at its end. The black clip originally was used with a metal pole that the patient holds in their hand, supplying the grounding. I clip the black clip on a diode ring or a diode chain that is touching the patient at the trouble site, so it is basically touching the patient's skin, grounding. The positive outlet on the right is connected to the black cord which has a red-handled probe that locates and or stimulates points. Like other ear point stimulators, at first the probe locates the most electrically active point on the skin. And it, if it is kept in contact with the skin point, it begins to stimulate it. In treatments, the black clip is connected to a diode chain or a diode ring that are taped onto the problem area and then covered with aluminum foil. The volume knob of the Hibiki 7 is turned all the way up and the red probe is used to find the most active ear point corresponding to the problem area and then stimulate it for seven seconds. You can often find a better point on the back of the ear rather than the front of the ear. The most famous Hibiki 7 treatment, at least in my book, is the thyroid neck treatment. This treatment is for both hypo and hyperthyroid, as well as for any neck problems. A diode chain is placed on the neck of the patient while sitting. Make sure the chain is tucked in under any clothes and is fully touching the skin. Connect the black clip to the chain. Wrap the whole neck with aluminum foil. The part of the chain dangling on the chest in the front will not be covered with a foil. Turn the Hibiki 7 on to full volume and probe the Kawaii Station ear point, also called Yang Linking in the Shanghai text. Once the probe finds the point, the dial will go up to the maximum and the Hibiki will start to beep. Keep the probe going for seven more seconds. If you do not find an active point immediately, try a slightly different location or change the angle of the red probe. I find that angling it upwards increases the conductivity. Once the dial swings to the maximum right, 
stimulate for seven more seconds. The patient will feel very mild tingling under the foil. Patients with very low blood pressure or weak nervous systems may feel the stimulation more strongly. If the dial never goes up to full speed, but the, the, but the patient does feel the tingling, that is fine also. Then you stimulate the other ear point on the other side. Let's see what that actually looks like. So I place a chain on the neck, clasp it so it's closed, and make sure that it's touching the skin so it's not over hair, it's not over clothes. Take the black clip of the Hibiki 7 and clip it onto the chain. Now take aluminum foil and I fold it three times so that it fits onto the neck and wrap it around the neck. So it's like a Victorian collar. So it's a little bit odd. It's a weird feeling to have this, you know, foil on your neck. You feel like Queen Victoria. Take the Hibiki 7, turn it on all the way. Take the red probe and go to the kawaii ear point where the tendon pops up when you lift the ear to the front ear move the earlobe to the front the tendon pops and stimulate the point once the hibiki 7 goes all the way up wait for seven seconds so you see the knob is all the way up i understand that the new hibiki 7s do not have that um uh, analog um, dial and then you do the other side go to the kawaii ear point and the Hibiki 7 here, you can see it actually went up a little bit more. And that's the whole treatment. Seven seconds on each side. Take the aluminum foil off. Take everything off. That's it. There is a similar treatment that is done with a three bypass cord and the Pachi Pachi. You place the chain on the neck, ensuring it is fully touching the skin. Place the red and green clips of the three bypass cord on the chain, one clip on each side of the neck. Ask the patient to turn their head slightly to the left. This exposes the right scalenes. With a black clip of, of the three bypass cord on the back of the pachi, spark the right scalenes. You're actually touching the skin with the pachi for a second or two. This produces a very uncomfortable sensation and the muscle should be jumping. Now ask the patient to turn their head to the right and spark the exposed left scalenes. This treatment is very, very quick. There is no foil. The black clip never goes back on the chain or anywhere else. The chain is removed once both sides have been sparked. So it's really you're just trying to get the muscle to jump and release, and that's pretty much it. Let's look at that. So she has the chain on already. The green clip goes on one side, her right in this case. The red clip goes on her left, the opposite side. I take the patchy. This is the black patchy that David Euler sells. And I'm going to spark, her, tur her head turns to the left. I'm sparking the right scalings. And you can see I didn't get a big jump. She said she felt it a little bit. So I decided to use the pink patchy, the old style patchy. I'm told they're the same, but so for some patients, they feel more one or the other. And you'll see here, she will jump. I'm now sparking the scales. You see how the trapezius jumps a little bit involuntarily. Let's do it on the first side. And you can see that there is an involuntary release of the muscle. And that's the whole treatment. The chain goes, goes away. The clips go away. This is it. It's basically a seven-second treatment. Uh, I, again, I'm told that there should be no difference between all the different patches. Uh, but as I said in my own experience, I tend to like the old patches and some patients um, tend to feel the pink one and nothing in this particular treatment, the black one, does not always produce the results. This is a very effective treatment, especially for tight neck muscles. However, the Hibiki 7 treatment is much better for thyroid and vertebrae problems. And because this treatment with the three bypass cord and the pachi feels like cattle probe, um, I tend to shy away from it and use the Hibiki 7 unless the muscles are very, uh, very, very tight and I actually have to do, use this one. Another famous treatment with the Hibiki 7 is uh, what Kawhi called seven second toothache treatment. Here, 
Um, when a patient has toothache, you can place the green diode ring on the pain area where you press and there's pain. Place the black clip of the Hibiki 7 on the ring. Find and stimulate the ear toothache point, which is on the earlobe, for seven seconds. And that's it. Um, this is really quite effective. In fact, um, this model, whom you've seen before, um, she really came just to, um, to, to show us how, to, how we do the facelift, but she also had terrible toothache um, that day, and that's why I took the picture of her here, and she actually has to um, have the tooth extracted. And she said, wow, there is absolutely no pain uh, on my tooth after we did this. So the Hibiki 7 treatments are really nice add-ons um, and they're very important. They may not be root treatments, but they do treat certain symptoms extremely well. And because of that, they, they gain a lot for you as a practitioner because they, they give the patient a very strong sense of confidence. That, wow, this is really working. So um, it is a very nice instrument to have. Kawai had one more um, seven second type treatment. This one actually takes a little more than seven seconds, which is the back uh, pain treatment. And this one actually uses a pen. There is no special instrument um, for this one except a ballpoint pen. You have the patient face the table with their legs together and figure out which hip is higher. Whichever hip is higher, take that side of the leg to the side that drops that hip down. So you're re-educating the patient's gait and then with a pen trying to get the muscles to adjust to that gait. When the legs are just apart, you press with a pen into just below L5 and then you press on the bladder lines on both sides, the paraspinals. Then you take that leg that went out to the side, keep it wide and take it back a few inches, that drops the hip even more. And then you press into L4 and the paraspinals. Then you take the leg a little bit further back, keeping it wide, and press below L3 and on the paraspinals. This is all done with a pen. Um, this is basically to re-educate the gait and re-educate the muscles and ligaments that are holding the spine and the sacrum to a different gate. Let's see what that looks like in actuality. So let me show you first what happens when we take the leg to the side. If one hip is higher, if you take that leg to the side, it naturally drops. That buttock is going to drop. Then if you take it further back, it will drop more. If you take it further back, it will drop more. You have your, the hands of the patient on the table because as they're moving back, they're going to feel a certain lack of balance. So have their hands leaning on something so that they don't um, feel out of balance. So let's look at that with a patient. So here, I'm determining that his right hip appears higher, so we take the right leg out, stimulate, taking the pen and pressing it into L5. Breathe in, breathe out, press the pen in. Breathe in. Press the pen in on the right paraspinals. Breathe in. Press the pen as he breathes out into the left paraspinals. Take the left further back. Go into L4. Let them breathe in and out. Press the pen in. Go to the paraspinals and the other side of the paraspinals. You can actually do it quite a bit slower than is shown here. And L3 with the leg once further back and on the paraspinals and you're not pushing you're just leaning as they breathe out into the muscles okay there will be a tendency by most patients to try and bend the front leg so tell them not to do that okay. so this is a really effective treatment uh, for back pain again it's one of those treatments we do at the very end um, just kind of as an add-on The bulk of this class has been on various treatments, highly effective ones, for specific problems. Kind of like a recipe book. Do this for this, follow this protocol kind of thing. People sometimes ask me if this is not just symptomatic acupuncture, and what about addressing the root? There is a strong tradition 
of arguing for revealing and treating the root of illness. And it sometimes becomes a matter of pride for some practitioners to not treat the symptoms, the so-called branch, but to only treat the root. In the earlier days, Kiko's style has been labeled by some people as so-called symptomatic acupuncture, implying by that that it was just chasing symptoms and not addressing root causes. I believe this came out of ignorance. People simply did not understand the style and were, they were so used to a particular way of addressing root problems that anyone addressing even for one moment a symptom seemed to them to be chasing after symptoms, which in my opinion is not what Kiko does at all. Kawaii did have root treatments, including the infinity treatments, as well as to some extent the use of the diet rings on the fingers. In my opinion, Kawai's root treatments are all about sending out energy waves to wash over the body, especially the torso, as a way of charging it up. But before addressing Kawai's root treatments, I would like to also suggest that treating the root or treating the branch really is not the question. In many cases, when we treat the root, we believe we cleared the cause and that, therefore, it is logical to expect that the branches will clear naturally. In accordance with the laws of cause and effect, once the cause has been fixed or eliminated, the effect should disappear naturally as it has no root feeding it anymore. But this logic fails to accept that cause and effect are merely concepts, and that even when the cause can be clearly identified, the effect which was once totally dependent on the root, now has a life of its own. It is not unusual to treat the root and yet still have symptoms. And we need to remember that patients usually come to us because of the symptoms that ail them. If we do not get rid of the symptoms, most patients will not come to us. It is also important to remember that root and branch cause and effect are interconnected. Just as the roots of the tree nourish the leaves, the leaves are nourishing the roots also. Roots and leaves depend on each other. Even though the roots are deeper and last longer, they still need and are dependent on the leaves. Sue 165 tells us that sometimes you can treat the root and sometimes you can treat the you can treat the branch. This is not just symptomatic relief or emergency medicine when we treat the branch. So 165 then says the same thing about going against and going with. Both are applicable methods. Of course, the idea of going with or going against implies many things in Chinese medicine. But in the context of root and branch, we can also look at it as saying that in treating such in treating, sometimes we go with the progression of disease, taking care of the root and cascading the positive effects towards the symptoms, as would be logically expected. That is going with the flow of the disease progression. And yet, sometimes we go against. Sometimes we can go to the piao, the surface, the symptoms. And when those are addressed, the root, the gen, gets better also. The treatments, the protocols offered here, are indeed mostly addressing the piao, but they are extremely important because without the outside, how can there possibly be a deeper root? It is not a lesser than method to address symptoms. It is only a lesser method if that is all we do and we ignore looking at the root, at the whole person, at causes, and at the constitution. For me, the superior practitioner can address the symptoms and affect the root, sometimes in ways that going after the root only might not help, because the body often creates feedback loops in which the root and the effect can no longer be so conveniently labeled and distinguished from each other. What are Kawai's root treatments? As I already said, I do not utilize the basic root treatments of Kawai's because they demand a lot of kutoshin and electric stimulation. I once treated Kawai 
and did some oki, direct moksa on him. And he laughed very kindly and then said, Oh, that's very nice. But really, how about the real thing? He wanted Kyutoshin, and he had no hesitation asking for it. Upon first encounter, one might look at Kawai's root treatments as basically very Chinese, using thicker needles, moxa balls in every needle, electric stimulation, sparking with Apache. The use of points seems, again, rather standard, and because of the concentration in the torso, it appears very Chinese. Kawai's root treatments would involve using REN2, REN6, REN12, or all three of them, often with stomach 27. He would connect these to a three bypass cord, creating triangles. For example, you might create a triangle from REN12 with a black clip on to stomach 27 on both sides with the green and red clips, and also a triangle from REN2 with a black clip to, to stomach 27, which might now carry two clips. Or you might create a triangle with two clips in the center and one on stomach 27, one triangle in each side. On the back, Kawai especially like gallbladder 21 and 25, or Yao Yan Shu, as affecting the upper and lower parts of the torso. Again, you can create many triangles, for example, going from UB25 to gallbladder 21, one on each side, or you can make it go to UB17 and then do upper body triangles. So there are many, many options. To those, an infinity treatment might be added, and perhaps diet rings on the fingers, activating the meridians. So it all feels quite busy. But all three components have one thing in common. They send a wave of energy into the body. With a diet ring, it is quite intuitive to us because we see it as activating the meridian at its beginning, thus sending out a wave through the channel. With the infinity treatments, we talked about the yin line going through the heart fire and then Ming Men fire, and then the yang line going crossing through the body from the bottom right to the, from the bottom left to the top right. So we see that there is a sending of a wave through the body, which we might explain as the pumping of the ions. But what about the component of the abdominal and back needles with Kyotoshin 3 bypass cord and electric stimulation? On first, first glance, it does not seem to have the elegance of the other two components. It seems almost like, oh yeah, primitive Chinese, strong, super strong stimulation. But that is not it at all. You may recall that the reason I do not use these components is not only because I find the constant moxa smell too strong, but also because I'm unable to use needles or spark them in the manner Kawai can without the patient feeling it. In fact, while Kawai's treatments appear like primitive strong stimulation, so to speak, they actually feel incredibly comfortable and feel like a gentle wave of energy melting you. In my observation, Kawai may appear to simply be using strong Chinese workhorse point, but he is actually doing something much more subtle in his root treatments. He's like a painter drawing triangles on a canvas. I call them triangles because of the, the three clips of the bypass cord, but they can be circles or any other shape. Then, like say a Mondrian, Kawai brushes in the triangle infusing them with paint, or in our case with energy, until the whole canvas is filled. The canvas in this case is the body, especially the torso. It is like filling up the battery and ensuring that it is done smoothly and that the battery is as well charged as possible and does not have any weird spikes as it releases its charge. This is how I see the way Kawhi treats the torso, brushing in charging up the battery like waves of charge moving in through. When we look at it that way, although the treatment may appear to be very Chinese and even aggressive, we can see that it has a different dimension and we can then implement sim similar ideas in different ways. Once the battery has been charged and the charge is even, the symptoms can be addressed using the various protocols using the toys. 
So how do we get the Kauai paraphernalia and what should you be buying? My personal recommendation is to start with a pair of iron pumping cords. One three bypass cord, at least one pair of diode rings and a pachi pachi. As you become more acquainted with the style and gain more confidence, and perhaps you might even get addicted to it, you can add more items such as the diode chain, magnetized diode rings, more three bypass cords, etc. At the beginning, you're not as likely to use two cords at the same time on a patient. Later on, you may find that you do. And while having a chain is very useful, at the beginning, as you get familiar with the style, you can get away with just diode rings and not chains on a fair amount of treatments. As you get more familiar and cases come up to you requiring more equipment, you will naturally be more willing to spend the money and get more equipment. Like the accumulation of other items, this can be fun as well as addictive. For example, the chain treatment for eyes can actually use a regular chain without diodes and use one chain in each ear. I have done that with just a regular chain from a hardware store and gotten good results. The chain treatment on the neck, on the other hand, clearly does work better with a diode chain. And then it also begs for a Hibiki 7, which is a whole other implemented, um, another equipment that you need to buy. So the accumulation of equipment, as useful as it is, can become a bit difficult. And that's why I suggest a minimal list to start off with and grow it up with time. Diode rings, chains, pachi pachis, three bypass cords, and iron pumping cords can be obtained from either David Euler in US dollars or from Andy Harrop in British pounds. The new Hibiki 7 stimulator can apparently be obtained from Joel Goldberg. I am told that the new F3 pointer stimulator can be obtained from Efrat Gavriel. Here are the phone numbers and the email addresses. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and that you will find success in treating patients with these new methods. My deepest gratitude to Kawai, to Kiko, and many, many other people who helped make this production possible.